let me introduce our, plan, our panel to you. Um, Sanchi Aranda, Professor Sanchi Aranda, who uh, is well known to many of you from her senior position here at the Cancer Institute for many years, Peter, Peter Mack previously, and now CEO of Cancer Council Australia. Professor Fran Boyle, Professor of Medical Oncology at the University of Sydney and Director of the Patricia Ritchie Cancer Centre for Cancer Care and Research at the Mater here in Sydney. Uh, Sandra Turner, um, who, <coughs> pardon me, Radiation Oncologist at the Crown Prince Mary Cancer Centre at uh, Westmead and also Clinical Lead in the Targeting Cancer Campaign and uh, a leading clinical trialist in, uh, in radiation oncology. Kat Adams, uh, psycholo clinical psychologist, uh, developed the clinical service at the Cal Calvary Mater in uh, Newcastle, therefore a long interest in psycho-oncology and, and many of the issues. Have I introduced everybody? I think I have. Don't forget your questions on the screen and come to the microphone. Um, Sanchia, the, um, we, we tend to sort of hive this off as a separate issue, don't we? You know, box it in. Psycho-oncology is over there. We'll call the psychologist. Yeah. <coughs> uh, I, I guess the, I'd like to respond to one of the points that Jane made, which has come out in all of the research I've ever done, and that is that one of the strongest predictors of psychological distress is physical symptom burden and other um, factors that make it uh, more difficult for the patient to live their normal lives. And I, and I think what that reinforces for me is that psychological care is everyone's business and we need um, everyone from whether it's, I remember at Peter Mac, one of the things was often patients were lost around the hospital <coughs> and um, we had to train the research laboratory staff to be kind and, and show them how to follow the red carpet squares. And even though they're on the spectrum. <laughs> yeah, it must be hard. Yeah. Um, or to even notice, it was actually partly it was about changing their worldview that they actually saw. And so that from everyone, from the laboratory researcher right through to the psychiatrist, um, care and improving the patient's experience was everyone's business. And, I, and I, the, a couple of the things that are related to that um, is that um, teamwork becomes really important. And one of the best innovations that I've ever put in place was um, actually enabling the, the nurse coordinator, the social worker and the psychiatrist uh, and the physiotherapist and the OT to actually have a weekly meeting um, that was separate to the MDT where they discussed the um, the other needs of patients and the ones that they were concerned about because that Why enabled... Why would it be separate to the MDT? Well, because the MDT focuses on treatment decision making and it's really difficult to get some of these issues um, into the fore. And, and, it, and what it did was really enable... Um, I think one of the things that Jane touched on is this often the stigma of accepting help and patients often put the pressure on the nurse. I remember a patient saying to me in a... In a clinical um, intervention uh, study we were doing in palliative care, well, I want to talk to you because you know me, um, you already come into the house, I don't want somebody different. And so what often happens when you're trying to make a referral, and I think learning to make a referral for psychological care is a, is a training need in and of itself, is that by doing this clinical care where a patient doesn't want a referral, when the team meets, the Allied health and psychiatry and psychology professionals can assist that nurse in the front line to take some intervention back, some strategies for how they're managing the patient. And what we used to teach people to do was to say, I've spoken to my colleague, um, Jane, she's the psychiatrist, and she suggested that this might be something really useful that you could um, do. And so you're starting to introduce Jane without it being about a referral and you gently move people in a direction um, that can really help. Kath, talk to me about this business of learning how to make a referral. Sandra, you're a bit out there. Do you want to come and sit beside Kath? Yeah, come and sit beside Kath. I think you'll be more cosy and in there kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, look, I think learning to make a referral is a really crucial part um, of the process and I think it's quite difficult and it touches on the stigma um, that most of us still experience around issues that may relate to discussing mental health with someone who's already physically unwell. 
Um, and I think we feel that often if we suggest making a referral to a psychologist or a social worker or a psychiatrist, that that's perhaps suggesting that this person is not coping well, that they're failing. And there's such a burden on patients and their families to cope, to stay positive, to do well. And so I think the concept of just gently, and as a psychosocial care professional, I'm constantly modelling, and I think Jane's right in saying that's our best approach in training, how do you talk about these issues? One of the things we do in Guiding Oncology is I actually get introduced to patients before they even know I'm the clinical psychologist. <laughs> and so you actually begin to build that rapport with one person to another person, not necessarily as it being a relationship where we're referring you to the psychologist because we think you need help. So tell me what the reveal was like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I take my undies and put them on the outside and say, I'm going to help you now. No. Um, <laughs> The reveal is often, um, it's the longer the patient has to be part of that conversation and to build that rapport and that sense of comfort, the easier it is. So we very rarely get shocked people anymore. And I've never had anyone say, get out of the room. You know, so it is certainly on the ward, it's very useful as well to, to loiter and just be part of doing a ward round, introducing, suggesting to the nursing staff ways that they can help. Right. That idea that um, in order to access uh, care from a psychologist with Medicare coverage in the private sector, which is where I work uh, mainly, uh, people actually are encouraged to go to their GP and get a mental health care plan. And uh, I think that's a barrier because it talks about mental health rather than normalising that this is actually an acute reaction often to a very significant stressor. And I know in the US the models for um, particularly social work and psychology referrals are different in that people who are members of the oncology team can actually make those referrals, get three sessions, decide whether you need to actually have a tailored longer term program and that's the point at which a mental health care plan uh, is probably going to be appropriate for longer term. And I wonder if that's an advocacy that we could take up um, with the Cancer Institute as a group that says there's actually a lot of resources out there in the private sector. There are people who are great, who are really well trained, but there's this extra step that the patient who's already overburdened needs to take. And it's and also one size fits all. You want to get a certain number of sessions. Uh, yeah, that's right. You get a certain number of sessions. So that's one thing I wonder um, if we can take up with Sancha. The second question that I can have... Can I just hold you just on yeah. that point, to hold the second one? I want to come back to Kath on this. That's fine. You know, you, you, even if you got the referral from the GP. I mean, I know the Psychological Society is very concerned about the fidelity to evidence-based practice in, in psychologists who are charging Medicare benefits. Mm -hmm. So there's no guarantee that you're going to get... Uh, interpersonal psychotherapy or CBT or some of the other ones that have an evidence base. You, know, you talk to psychologists, oh, I'll give them a bit of narrative therapy and a bit of this, a bit of that. Um, to what extent do psychologists know how to deal with people who are living with cancer and the issues that arise there? So you're going to refer out into this great unknown. To whom? It's a good question. We did a, a small study a few years ago where we actually, within Hunter, New England, um, local health district, recognised that we had, at that time, I think three psychologists who were in full-time positions or full-time equivalent positions. So we didn't have enough psychologists in our area to refer people to. So we actually did some training and it was a simple one-day training package where we offered psychologists who were working in the private sector a, an introduction and, and covering some of those topics around what is cancer, what does it do to people, what are some of the terms you might see. And the really interesting thing we saw was that the, the people that were involved felt, and Jane, your study reflected the same thing, they didn't feel confident in managing depression in a cancer patient, and yet it was something that they were very confident to manage in people without cancer. And so I think part of it is ensuring if we do advocate for that, and I think it's a good idea, Fran, that we look at then providing training to psychologists in psycho-oncology, and it doesn't have to be extensive training, but it needs to be some training, but it needs to be training in the interventions that we know are particularly effective. As well. I'll come to your question in a moment. Sandra, we, I, I want to come back to that issue of team-based care, the multidisciplinary team, whether you separate this from the team or not, and the extent to which you can get multidisciplinary teams to accept that psychosocial care is part of what they should be talking about all the time. 
Yeah, I might go back one step, Norman. I guess I'm sitting here thinking this is a fantastic forum and I love being surrounded by people that care about psychosocial care. And then I go back to my real world. Mm -hmm. On Monday, in a huge, you know, probably one of the biggest cancer centres in the private sector in um, <coughs> western suburbs, and, you know, being able to loiter in any way, it just sounds like a dream. You know, if only we had the staff to loiter. Uh, I mean, so in theory, well, a that's lot what of... radiation oncologists did all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not talking about everybody. I mean, if we had our really small, fantastic, stretched um, psycho-oncology team that had any capacity to loiter and be there, and, and of course, we'd love to integrate them into um, all our teams from, from the beginning, and I take on board every, everything that everyone has said. It's fantastic, but it is... And unless there were more resources and more staff um, or people there, we can't do anything but deal with the more severe end of the spectrum um, and prevention's really difficult. Can I make a somewhat provocative comment? Uh, when we did the POMF study, we re included a private cancer centre. We excluded patients who were already having treatment for depression. So when we recruited at the public hospitals, our recruitment numbers, our rates were low. We had fewer numbers of patients who were approached who were eligible. In the private centre, virtually everyone we approached uh, who was depressed was eligible because none of them were getting uh, treatment for their depression. Um, I get a phone call or an email every week uh, from someone in private saying, oh, could you just see this one patient? I haven't done any private practice for 26 years. Could you just see this one extra patient? And I say, no, I can't. Um, and the comments that I get are, oh, it's too hard to find a psycho psychiatrist. It's too hard to find a psychologist. I actually think we have to get over this double standard. If you were an oncologist and had a patient who'd had a stroke, you would find a physician. If you had a patient who had diabetes, you'd find an endocrinologist. I think the notion it's too hard is not a sustainable argument. Which raises the issue, Fran, of models of care in the private sector, the great unknown. I have the great benefit of working in the sheltered workshop over there at the MARTA where um, psychosocial care, and particularly pastoral care as well, which we haven't really touched mm. on uh, today, uh, is a great resource for patients. So we do have integrated psychosocial care into both our early cancer team, we focus mainly on breast cancer, but we run a separate multidisciplinary team for patients with advanced cancer. And I think you've probably touched on the fact that they are not commonly covered by early cancer teams and more focused on treatment decisions. And our metastatic cancer, MDT, includes all of the allied health uh, people that you've mentioned. Uh, it also runs every week and it often tends to tap on people who've had a hospital admission. Uh, rather than outpatients. And what's interesting is that we share that multidisciplinary team with the renal physicians because palliative care for renal disease is actually a very big issue at our site as well. And I've been quite, um, I suppose, surprised to think that sometimes in cancer we're a bit precious about our patients and their needs and all you have to do is hear about people on chronic dialysis to realise... So no, this is a terrible condition sorry. as well. So we probably need to think about sharing resources a little bit more rather than thinking everything has to be about cancer. You know, in your hospital, there are people with advanced chronic illness who need palliative intervention. Maybe your own MDT needs to be shared with them as well. Sorry for interrupting, Fran. Does, should we be advocating then as a group to the Safety and Quality Commission that there should be a quality standard for private public standards around psycho-oncology? A absolutely. The, the, the availability of resources using something like the tiered model um, that uh, Jane put up and which is um, certainly the model that's been adopted in Victoria and, and across Canada means that for every service they should be saying how they meet the needs of patients across the spectrum from the training of their frontline staff right through to what the referral pathways are and that those should be documented and available for, from an equitable um, access perspective. And I think, um, you know, Jane talked a little bit about the work from Cancer Council Queensland with their telehealth psychology um, model and, and that telehealth service is now providing services into um, Victoria as well as um, across Queensland. And so... This is the one based out of Townsville? Yeah, uh, no, the one... No, this is a psycho-oncology service in, in Brisbane, um, next door to the Cancer Council Queensland. 
So that, so that I think what we're starting to see is that there are um, fewer barriers to access for people in quite isolated environments, and that often what you all you need locally is a is a health professional involved in that pa that patient's care who can be the link person back to the telehealth specialist. And it, I think it means that we've got to really m make sure we're using our highly skilled professionals in supporting the frontline mm -hmm. staff and in taking on the referrals of the people who have higher levels of need. And in fact, one of our questions online was exactly about that, about telehealth. Just Jane, and then I'll come to your question yeah. here. Um, I, I think that when we're looking at models, and we talked a lot about this yesterday, I think it's easy to say we don't have this and we don't have this and we can't do anything. I think that we can be more proactive. In Queensland, we've got a psychiatry interest group. I'm aware that a lot of colleagues in private practice would quite like to see people with cancer but feel they don't know enough about it. And so setting up an interest group, a supervision group, allows me to be a conduit of a lot of the information and resources to which they don't have ready access. But the other thing that, that I think is a fantastic model, when I started working in the gynae oncology unit at Royal Brisbane and going to the team meetings, on one occasion, I'd been there a little while, and the gynae oncologist said, you know, Jane, it's a real problem, but we didn't have all this anxiety and depression before you started working here. Um, but, but then he approached, he, didn't, he approached me, and I wasn't able to do this, but I linked in a colleague. So he, in his private rooms, got a psychiatrist, a very experienced psychiatrist, interested in cancer, and she came and she did a three-hour session in his private rooms every fortnight. He didn't charge her rent, he didn't charge her secretarial fees, it was embedded, and he just said, I have a psychiatrist, I would like you to see them. It was a win-win. He went out and made it happen. And that is a certainly a model. A lot of surgeons have breast care nurses who work with them. Why can't we look at a model of a psychologist or a psychiatrist who's embedded in a private practice? Yes. It'll come on, just keep talking. Hello. <laughs> um, I'm a radiation therapist by trade, and I just wanted to speak to the difficulties I found in my practice of making referrals. I remember I had a very young breast patient, and um, you know I knew her children's names, and we spoke every day. And one day I asked her how she was doing, and she said, actually, not well. I think my marriage is on the verge of collapse. And I said to her, well, do you want to talk to someone about it? And I really feel for me that that really broke our rapport at that stage. It because broke Because she rapport. felt that I couldn't deal with her problems, so I was trying to brush it off. And um, I didn't have the skills to help her. But I was just wondering what you think about kind of a multi-pronged MDT approach where I didn't even know the name of the psychonk to refer her to. I just knew that maybe one existed, but where perhaps it would have been better if the next time that happened, I would be able to in bring that person into the room and say, this is our, you know, person, this is our psychonk, and, you know, would you like to talk to her? Or maybe we can both sit together and chat about it, and maybe that would have built that trust and maintained that rapport a bit better. Just uh, as a radiation oncologist, part of your same sort of professional team network, I think that is a problem internally within cancer centres. That's where there should be a system where all the professionals that are dealing with these patients as a team have a system for if there's somebody, I mean, you shouldn't feel like you need to, to deal with the burden of that person's grief and distress either. That's something that should be shared with the oncology nurse. Um, the radiation oncologist should know about that. And then as a, as a group, you can, somebody may be more skilled than you to sort of make that entree into getting some psychological support. Um, and I think that's where, you know, within our organisations and our clinical services, we need to be very conscious that other members that may be the chosen person to um, develop that rapport with a person. I mean, you're seeing patients on treatment every day. As a doctor, I might be seeing them once a week or fortnight while they're on treatment. So it's something we have to get working within our sort of professional um, health, medical teams as well. I mean, Kath, quite a lot of thought's been given to what the right response there is and train people to actually capture that moment. What, what, how do you capture that moment when somebody declares to you? I think um, I have the advantage of 11 years of training in how to capture the moment. And I think 
the, okay, the issue. Okay, 90 seconds. Yeah, yeah the then. issue that's been raised, though, is it's, it's about being able to introduce the, the topic in a way that doesn't upset the person, and you can't always do that. There will always be, no matter how well you do it, no matter how gently you introduce it, there will always be people that feel betrayed because they're building a relationship with you. And as Jane said, once you've seen someone once as a therapist, you can't see someone else. And it's exactly the same position. And I think it's actually where psycho-oncology needs to be a little more active in providing proper training and support and just, just trying to look at ways we can loiter. Um, but also, as part of all of our models of care, looking at referral pathways so that there are very clear, well-defined referral pathways. But a lot of thought has been given to psychological first aid, mental health first aid, and what your first, the, kind of the first responder here, and what you say actually matters, don't you? Yeah, so certainly one of the pieces of work that when we were looking at the supportive care framework in Victoria was that what the nurses were telling us, and the, I think the example from the... Um, individual then is the same, is that they were worried about opening um, the conversation and therefore immediately wanted to make a referral. And so one of the things we did was develop some five minute video um, vignettes and, and training vignettes around the common kind of issues that patients would raise that gave people enough um, ideas about how to open and close a conversation because what they need to be able to do is understand a little bit more, be prepared to ask if the person actually wants help or whether they're just venting, make sure that they're safe um, and be able to make an offer of safe, help. Safe, meaning they're not thinking of harming themselves. That's right, um, and, that, and that you've got a, a moment in time, so particularly where patients were, de were making declarations of suicidal ideation or um, some basic things that you could do to know that when you left the consultation with that patient that it was that you felt that you'd left the patient in a safe place but that you'd left the door open for them to come back to you and then you've got the opportunity to go and talk to your colleagues about how you might handle their next visit rather than ending with something that you feel has broken the relationship and that you've got nowhere then to go. Which comes to cast loitering and the availability of supervision and mentoring in this situation. Um, I might just go to a couple of questions online, um, and we'll come to you in a second, if you don't mind. One is uh, uh, a question about how are patients and families able to access affordable counselling during treatment and through survivorship. And I'm assuming by counselling we're talking about evidence-based care rather than just generalised counselling, which has got no evidence base behind it. Therapeutic communication. Affordable. Okay. Um, it depends on... Well, just before we go on... Yep. I cast a stone there on generalised counselling, which got a ripple, but there really isn't very much evidence for it, is there? And there's some evidence of harm. There's, there is some evidence of harm, but there is some evidence that a um, supportive therapeutic interaction is of great benefit. And certainly um, the work that was done, um, some of the early work done in the States, looking at supportive counselling for women with breast cancer and groups that ran over years and years and years and years. But there was obviously enormous benefit for those women and there was a decreased risk of them developing a depression compared to the women that weren't um, receiving that care. I think everything has its place. I think um, you can certainly be the recipient of very poor psychological care from well-trained professionals as well. I think <laughs> um, I'm hesitant to cast too many stones myself, but I think... One of the things that's difficult um, often for cancer patients is they are quite vulnerable when they're seeking help. And I think it's important that we all have an awareness of the fact that they may well take on information that is promising them something that can't necessarily help them. And I think there's a risk there. I don't know how we overcome that, Norman. I think that's... that's it's, it's a bugbear of yours, Fran, I mean, you, this issue of affordable care. I think one of the ways that... Um, you can make care more affordable is by group care. And I think there is some evidence that um, particularly um, people perhaps with underlying anxiety before they get cancer might benefit from group care and that might be more affordable. Although as my daughter's psychologist was saying yesterday, you put on a group for people with social anxiety and nobody turns up. <laughs> um, and, and exactly the people who might benefit from coming to a group are the people who won't come to the group. Just like uh, this meeting which made me laugh. Um, but uh, one of the things that we haven't touched on very much is mindfulness and mindfulness and meditation training. And I think in the sense of preventing relapse from depression and managing some of the underlying issues for cancer patients, 
the evidence for that. And for health professionals, you'll probably come back to this this afternoon. And some of that training is pretty readily available online. The Cancer Council's actually um, provide some good resources and uh, along with some of the other brain training strategies that you can do online to help you as a cancer survivor manage cognitive impairments. I think there are some quite cheap things uh, that patients maybe don't get referred to that might be a good supplement to seeing a psychologist and one of the roles of seeing a psychologist or a mental health professional is their ability to refer people to self-help uh, strategies or groups and I think that is something that we've underutilised, probably. Okay. I think in terms of looking at group interventions, you're absolutely right, Fran. I think it's something we should be considering in the next five years is how do we look at putting into place a structure where we can provide preventative psychoeducation, in a sense, for patients when they're first diagnosed that will often help them overcome a lot of the anxieties they have about treatment and feel supported and may only need one intervention. There's, a, there's strong evidence from Linda Carlson's group in Canada, her mindfulness-based cancer recovery is an eight-week program that has very strong results for people once they've finished their treatment, finished active treatment and um, are survivors as such. I think there's a lot of interventions we could be looking at, you know, but we don't necessarily have the support to be able to do them. And it's coming down to grassroots level of, will my hospital allow me to have a room that I can run a group in, you know, and I actually think we need to start at that very basic level and look at those availabilities, but so it's the, certainly the opportunity to provide a lot of care to a lot more patients. So the shout out, they've got this great psycho-oncology service, but they don't provide any facilities for Fantastic, it. Fantastic, yeah. Uh, just before I come to you, another quick question from online, which is, where are the psycho-oncology training facilities in Australia, if any? Okay, got the answer for that one. <laughs> We've yes. got to find one of these great people. <laughs> Thank you very much, Norman. I'm Kathleen Hodgkinson, clinical psychologist. I think we've really heard today that making an effective referral is a very skilled task, and I think we can be doing better at trying to help health professionals do that, do that well. There's also things we can do to help us become more visible to patients and, and to reduce the stigma. I think, however, if we're saying this is a vital part of care, and yet we're having a conversation with a patient that they need to go to a GP, probably have a long consultation at extra cost, you know, with, with an impact on more travel, um, more fatigue, to then be able to access psychological services. I think it's a really significant barrier, and I'm really excited for Fran and other people here to maybe be thinking about going away and what we can do to change that, to increase access. Maybe you want to make a comment or just take that into Can I just make a comment, and I'm being somewhat controversial here. Uh, the cancer, um, COSA headlines in the news yesterday described lymphoma patients in Australia as being the most stressed in the world because they're paying for such high cost drugs. And we talk about affordability, um, and that is an issue. But patients at Royal Brisbane who are there all day, and that is not uncommon, pay $32 for parking. That is not reimbursed, it's not tax deductible. Patients have huge out-of-pocket costs. The BCNA study showed that most women with advanced cancer have at least $5,000 of out-of-pocket costs. I think that we devalue ourselves if we assume that people do not always want to pay for our services. Sometimes people can't, but I don't think we should make the assumption because I think it devalues what we offer. In the private sector, it could be up to 20000 or more. Yes. Hi, I'm coming from a radiation oncology background as well, and I just want to say, firstly, thank you for being such an inspirational panel um, and providing all your insight. Also, I want to be able to say that one of the most memorable things for me when I was working in the US in oncology was the induction program. So you, Jane has spoken about giving people who have contact with patients the language and the skills to be able to talk to people. And right up front in that induction program, they ran a number of sessions that taught people the language and how to communicate with patients. And that included people who are administrative staff, cleaning staff, and all of the healthcare professionals. And it was very memorable, and it's something that changed my practice. I also want to say also that um, there are a number of resources out there at the moment. I think as a um, person in the clinical space, it's overwhelming how many resources are out there at the moment and not knowing which resources to turn to. So I'm ashamed to say that in my 15 years of practice, I've never actually said to a cancer patient, you could call the Cancer Council helpline. 
um, that's pretty appalling on my behalf, but it's also something that I haven't heard my, <laughs> my colleagues say. But these resources are out there, they're simple things that we could potentially discuss, particularly with people in that sort of mild to moderate um, area that need help. Um, and as, as people on the floor, we're not recommending these services because we're either overwhelmed, we don't know about them, we don't know how to go about it, or there's no time built into our schedules to be able to have these conversations, conversations with people, or no physical space. So that goes back again to the comment that Kath made about actually looking higher up about how these services are provided at the physical space and the time in which we have to do that. And just because these patients aren't being seen, their needs aren't being met. Um, in actual fact, one of the studies was looking at medical records um, and not a single radiation therapist had documented any referral to any form of psychosocial care. It's not to say that that referral wasn't being made, but it's not being documented. So therefore, it would be easier for people who are higher up to say there is no need for this service. So we need to start documenting. We need to start looking at the people that are falling through the cracks and accounting for those people and therefore generating the need to make those changes. And on a positive note, the first um, trial of psychoeducation in using um, um, radiation therapists as the intervention point is just completing, um, uh, being led by Georgia Halkett in WA. And, and I think that, the, uh, that, that there was a, a bit of a loss in radiation therapy training um, over the years where uh, particularly, I think, as, my, as nurses became more predominant in radiation therapy settings, more, uh, I think the therapist role in some of that got lost, and I, I think it's really important that we bring some of it back in. But can I just make a point about the 13, 11, 20 service? It's just um, Anna Boltong from Victoria has just completed a, an evaluation um, of the patients and, and family perspectives of using the helpline both here in the US and in the UK. And often professionals are actually quite um, worried about referring to the 131120 service because they think that it's actually going to say some things that are not to do with the clinical care and that somehow things will become undone. Interestingly, the users of the service fully understand the difference between the, the support they get from the the helpline, which is much more focused on self-care strategies, um, being able to be to develop the health literacy, um, rehearse the questions they might want to ask their clinician, access services and support groups, and they understand that that's very different than what they get from their health professionals. And so, one of the things we're looking at at the moment nationally is whether we need the development really of marketing um, approaches to encourage a 13, 11, 20 referral as part of a standard of care for a new diagnosis. But do they get what they need? I mean, we've got a lot of infrastructure, Beyond Blue, Lifeline mm -hmm. and others. Should, uh, Beyond Blue does special, sub-specialise in certain areas. Should we be encouraging them to provide Abs the service? Absolutely. Yeah. What, what, so what the idea um, would be, I think, is that uh, the 13, 11, 20 kind of notion of referral is, just a, gateway. is a gateway. And in fact... So Cancer Council in New South Wales, for example, works with the Myeloma Foundation and all of its support groups are accessible through um, Cancer Council. So, you know, I've got a job to do to try and bring all of that together. And I think it's important because two years ago on this platform, Kerry Clover talked about the work from um, Newcastle where around about 65% of people who scored four or more on the distress thermometer reported not wanting help. Partly that was because they didn't think their needs were legitimate. And the other part was they actually wanted to be helped to help themselves. And I believe we've seriously underdone that and we'll talk about it this afternoon. Which the National Mental Health Survey supported is that a lot of people with depression don't want help at, for no, quite good reasons. Yeah. And they, they may to want to them. access services, but they don't want to another person in their lives. And particularly in advanced cancer and people during treatment, I think we have to understand people are overwhelmed. It's, it, it is a very exhausting thing, just getting to treatments and getting back again. And sometimes we just need much simpler, easy, accessible things to, to help people uh, take steps. So, sorry, do you want to say something, Fran? I might just make a comment related to um, when you might need to have some of that specialised input. And, and that's really about prescribing in patients who are on um, polypharmacy, particularly in the advanced cancer setting. And we do have a psychiatrist who does sessions in our rooms. And one of the things we use her for is help in choosing antidepressants for people who are on 20 other drugs. 
lots of the antiemetics, uh, tamoxifen, uh, for those who treat breast cancer, you know, Zoloft's not the answer. And uh, that sort of thing about, you know, it's a very physically unwell person with a prolonged QT interval from six other things. How can we get our psychiatrist to help us? So really having someone who's got that prescribing knowledge on your team is really critical. Not that everyone's going to need an antidepressant, uh, but if you don't have that person um, so accessible in your team, you're going to be making mistakes. So we've got a question here um, online from a small rural treatment centre. No specialists on tap. Nobody's loitering, as you said before, but they've got the same problems as everybody, you know, their patients and care, carers have the same problems as everybody else. What do they do? So models of supervision have been around for a while and there's certainly data that um, tele-supervision is seen as highly acceptable. I think you can upskill some of these people and provide them with access to supervision. I think we, we think that hospitals own patients, they don't. GPs manage the bulk of depression in the community. Okay, cancer may not be as common a problem as heart disease or diabetes, but I think with access to specialist information and support, those people can, can readily um, manage that. Uh, don't forget too, there is an item number for telepsychiatry, and psychiatrists will provide televised consultations. There's an item number for it. How do you choose a psychiatrist who knows anything about cancer care? But this comes back to the whole notion of us needing networks and that each local health district needs to understand all of its needs from across mm -hmm. its whole um, perspective and make sure that, the, that everyone's in a safe network of practice mm. so that every patient has, the, has um, the access to those services. But uh, when Sandra, this has arisen, now you've got distributed psycho, you know, radiotherapy services in cancer treatment centres around Australia who don't necessarily have this infrastructure, how have they been dealing with it? Uh, I'm sure completely ad hoc and probably not at all. And even as an experienced, you know, quite senior radiation oncologist in the metropolitan area, I don't know how, if I needed to encourage somebody to be linked up with a, a you know, telepsychiatrist, not that you need to in Sydney, but, you know, I wouldn't have the first clue how to access that person, find who is experienced, if somebody junior in a regional radiation oncology centre said, I've got this person, what do I do, how do I get them care? I would be saying, I don't know how to get care for my own patients half the time. So I think that's where maybe um, we do need to sort of make it all our responsibility and and maybe, for instance, you're talking about marketing the, the Cancer Council as a, as a sort of um, a, a, an entry into what other services might be available. That I would find, I would think that would be very useful for even people that have been around a long time to understand um, what that would but look all, like. But you're all trumpeting your MDTs. You, so your MDTs are clearly totally inadequate because they're not actually giving the whole In terms of psychosocial patient. care, I would say probably 90% uh, of MDTs uh, are totally inadequate. And the, and the MDS item is actually about diagnosis and treatment planning. It's not actually about anything else. So those meetings and the ability to bring those clinicians together has a very specific purpose and I think we re need to really not confuse that with the wider um, care of patients that we Let's need face to it, they can't even get that aspect right a lot of the time. Exactly. <laughs> Kathy, what did you comment earlier? Oh, I think, you know, a lot of us in pockets are doing a lot of good work looking at how we can use the tiny amount of resources that we have the best we can. And I think we need to just sit down and look at what all of those options are. Certainly telehealth is something for psycho-oncology that can be a godsend, both for patients and for clinicians in, in terms of clinical supervision. And I'd have to say all of the clinical supervision I've been involved in people get a lot of benefit and it is dev directly benefiting the patients, it's helping that support. But we actually need to sit down together and talk about all of the different things that we're doing and try and actually come up with a unified plan. And the provision of that supervision um, is often seen as not required to be funded. And when we uh, implemented the key coordinator roles at Peter Mac, we implemented clinical supervision. And for the first five years, I funded it from my research budget and it was impossible to get it um, ongoing funded. And the nurses talked about how critical it was to them to be able to do their job. And, and can I support that? That was a uh, finding from the prompt study that really surprised me, that, that people were just clamouring. They were just saying, it has changed my life and the way I think about things. 
So just hold on a second. I, I want to get into the, sort of the implementation discussion. I'm going to implementation discussion in one of the parallel sessions this afternoon, but it's around specific research projects. I'll, yeah, I will come to you in a second. I realize you can't watch the microphone, so just want patience for a moment. We spent a fortune in Australia on clinical care networks. You know, we've got and diabetes networks. Queensland's bloody full of them. You know, we've got clinical networks all over the place. How do we, so we can criticize them and say the cancer, the cancer networks are inadequate. That's fine to say that. What's the implementation track to make? Standards and indicators. Mm -hmm. Forcing them to conform. You've got to measure it. If you don't measure it and show it and benchmark it, nothing changes. So that's like a 10-year process to get the Safety and Quality Commission online? No, no, I think the Cancer Australia stuff is um, starting to do it. Uh, Victoria, in the Cancer Action Plan, nearly 10 years ago, put screening for distress in as an indicator that had to be reported by every health service. And it's a start. And once you start showing it, then you've got to put services behind it. Um, and you know, one of the things, that, not in a psycho-oncology way, but one of the things that Peter Mack was, we identified with distress screening that 40% of patients in, in the head in the um, lung service were um, malnourished and had lost more than 10% of weight at diagnosis. And yet all of the nutrition support was in other um, in disciplines. And so that meant that then suddenly there had to be an investment in nutrition support in lung cancer. So making it... Um, visible is what brings funding. Let's take two questions. Person, be very patient at the back. Here. No, it's you. Yeah. Hello, I'm uh, Veronica Fenning from uh, MARTA in Newcastle uh, with the medical oncology team as a social worker. I've been there for a bit over 20 years. I'm wanting to talk on the subject of loitering, <laughs> which has come up a couple of times. I think... You don't look like a loiterer. Well... <laughs> It's something that I loitered a lot more 20 years ago, I can tell you, than now. Uh, time is pretty poor. However, I think that social work as a profession can get overlooked, but at the Mater, I'm happy to say there are a lot of nurses that are very good at letting us know about those situations that come up in conversations, um, like the crumbling marriage or the death of my brother last week or, you know, various things that have got people unstuck and they don't know what to say. They don't actually say to them, I'm going to get social work, but they let us know. And the next time they're having chemotherapy, we loiter. <laughs> and we just see where they're at. I don't have the time to do a lot of ongoing counselling anymore, but, that's, but we have our psychologists. So I can assess where they're at. Just be that listening presence, assess whether they might be ready for some uh, interventions longer term and refer on. I just think that's an important one to remember that social work in many, I don't know, probably not all facilities, but in many facilities social work is there and perhaps has more of a potential to loiter because they don't have fixed clinic appointments as such. We have meetings, we do have some appointments, but don't forget social work. <laughs> I, I think it's one of the, the issues that we have is we have some social workers that are appointed in cancer-specific positions and some that are in generalist positions. And certainly, in my mind, psycho-oncology, you know, the, the three main specialist professions are social work, psychology and psychiatry, with the rest of the team being involved in the general psychosocial care. But I think you make a very strong point, Veronica, that social workers are often the ones who are able to loiter and identify the problems and, and provide the support and refer on as necessary. Also, do have interventions, even if it, so. I think um, counselling is one thing, but in the uh, the Envy's, uh, you know, the breast cancer networks, so advanced breast cancer survey, um, financial um, toxicity was actually one of the big pieces that was, and, and that also prevents people help seeking and a whole lot of other things. But uh, and and many of those patients had not had appropriate referrals to social work. I, I guess that's really important, Sanjia, that that we do look at a lot of those um, we, in that listening process, just work out what is the most pressured thing at the moment, and sometimes it is finances. Sometimes it is, um, I'm going to have to leave the house because of violence or whatever. Sometimes it's, you know, I, my, my transport person is sick now, I can't rely on them anymore. You know, those sort of pressures are paramount first <laughs> before dealing with the other ones. 
The, uh, the other quick thing I want to mention is that I think mindfulness is very important, that together with an occupational therapist in oncology, we provide a, a meditation group on a weekly basis, an open one, which incorporates mindfulness. And sometimes when people don't want to be referred to uh, counselling, they might start with something like that, you know? It's less threatening, perhaps, to just come along to... Knowing they don't have to sign up for eight weeks, they just come along for an open practice group. Thank and, you. Thank you for that comment. Yes. Oh, hi, I'm Diane. I've been involved with uh, follow-up care of colorectal patients. So um, after their surgery, I ring them once a year on their anniversary to see how they're going, make sure they're not dead. Um, and the biggest thing I noticed is all they want is they just want to be listened to. And actually, I, once a year I ring them and they would, when I do, they would say, we've been waiting for your call. Mm. And so I would, which is amazing. They mm. just want someone to listen to. But I think there's a big gap. And these are people who are being regularly seen for surveillance. So yes. it's not as if you're the only person. No, that's them. right. So, so people aren't necessarily asking the and right And they questions. want to talk to someone that's sort of like, um, that knows a bit about it, not necessarily an expert or a clinician. They want to talk to someone that's... Um, understands that they can actually vent to and not worry their family about things. And, and, and it's, and it's not someone that's going to give them, give them um, uh, a remedy for whatever. And what are the things they bring up in that conversation? Well, the biggest thing that they, um, a few of them brought up was there's no support care after they leave hospital in the fact that it's off you go. And it's the thing... And what they want there's, um, is that's not utilised is that we should be setting up support groups where the actual patients get together and do it. The, for the colorectal cancer, there's a support group run at the Sands Hospital and only, and the, there's recently been one set up at Concord Hospital. But I talked to the patients that ha couldn't, you know, had trouble getting to the SAN. They said how wonderful it was. And this is just discussing stuff like, good grief, are you mortified that you can't find a toilet when you're in yeah. the mall, you know? And it's, so it's self-help. And it's run by, I think, so, uh, social workers or uh, the nurses. And this is not being utilised. No one's... If you're set up, and not necessarily just for cancer patients, but for, you know, um, cardiac patients and all the rest of it, I mean, support groups. Huge issue. I mean, if you've had an ultra low, you've got you know, all these 60 year old men with ultra you know, rectal cancer you know, with major disability. It's a huge yeah. issue. So I'll do my next advertorial. So um, um, I think that peer support is something that we haven't done enough development of. I remember when I was a uh, training nurse in New little south of New Zealand, there was a colorectal cancer survivor who um, is currently not having her 96th birthday very soon. Um, who came and did all of the visits to all the colorectal patients, and uh, breast cancer's done it for years. But it, it, the advertorial is the Cancer Connect program, in that um, it, one of the expressed needs that's been um, expressed to the Cancer Council is the need to do this. And so Cancer Connect matches people um, and, and support, and the feedback from that is really positive. And there's also some of the Cancer Council's run Care Connect as well. Um, and so those kinds of services are there. There's an overlap here with a pet topic of yours, Sandra, which is decision regret. Mm. Oh, I was thinking about that. Mm. Mm. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'll, I'll try and be brief. Um, but it was it was really resonating to me when Jane was was talking about um, dealing with the psychological morbidity, which isn't illness, mm. you know, which isn't disorder. And we've talked a lot about sort of dealing with cancer treatments and survivorship and all those things, which are critically important, but. Um, I, I'm really interested in the, the morbidity that comes from the way information is delivered or not delivered or the absence of information and how that can impact long term on people's lives if they feel like they haven't been adequately informed, particularly if they have toxicity and financial toxicity of treatments and they, they weren't adequately um, inf informed about that. And I think I, I hear in, in some of my senior colleagues... Um, were discussions like, oh, you know, decision or regret. I don't believe in decision or regret. Um, despite all the evidence... In any case, and that's a urologist talking? I didn't say that, Norman. 
Um, so look, particularly where there are options for deci decision making, I subspecialise in prostate cancer and it's a massively big area um, and there is a lot of morbidity out there um, from men regretting or not feeling like they've had the information up front. And, you know, it almost I almost didn't mention it because it's like a drop in the ocean of some of the things we're talking about today, but in terms of long-term survivorship, it can be a major issue. And you're... Sorry, go on. I was just going to say, um, one of the, the small projects um, we looked at doing a few years ago was um, for young women with breast cancer, who the question about whether or not to have a mastectomy was a, a bit of a dicey one. Um, I was working in a private practice at the time, so I was routinely, the patients were sent to see me, and we actually worked through the decision tree. I think that was a crucial part of the process, but I think another crucial part was we actually delayed that surgery for a week which gave the women time to think about it. And I think it's, it's often the same. There's an enormous pressure that you've got this cancer and you have to have the surgery and that's going to so in a week's time. And people wake up from the anaesthetic thinking, well, I can't have cancer. There's no cancer in my family. They're not really at the point where they're ready to look down and see that they have no breast. You know? So I think that, that's part of the process. Which is kind of what I was alluding earlier when we were talking, well, you know what I was alluding to in terms of the prevention story, but it's you know, the intervention at which part of the journey. And, you know, we are talking about over here in the cancer journey and we're not doing that much down here. I think this was um, really mentioned by um, our speaker up the back there in terms of induction into the cancer world and routinising things like communication skills training. And, and I participated with Jane in that uh, original NBCC project. And it is difficult to find uh, clinicians who will be able and afford to take time out of clinical practice to become communication training facility, uh, facilitators. And at Sydney University, we have a very wide range of people who um, do facilitation with our medical students and some fairly basic um, you know, recognition of emotional distress and you know, ways to manage that. And I think as clinicians come up through the medical schools, they're hopefully their communication skills are going to be a little bit better as, as they grow up with understanding that form of treatment, uh, of training. But has finding, that been your experience? Well, I think so. I think gradually there is, um, and I speak mainly from a medical oncology perspective, the younger generation are coming up with better skills and also um, a better ability to use some of the tools like decision aids, which we've done some research with um, uh, currently in the area of neoadjuvant chemo for breast cancer. So I think you'll see a wave of people coming into the cancer world who hopefully have learnt a little bit better from the ground up. You'll probably come back to this this afternoon. What happens then is they get swamped and overwhelmed and their enthusiasm wanes and... And they, they might be working with oncologists who don't share their values and yeah, professionalise into other behaviours. Exactly right. The head of department... Um, slags off at them because they're taking a little bit longer with their consultations and not pulling their weight. Uh, and so I think you need to think about that, that resource of the person who comes in fresh and enthusiastic and a bit better trained and how do you sustain them in a world where clinicians get no supervision, psychological or otherwise, and may use their MDTs to help support them. And that's one of the functions of our metastatic MDTs to support ourselves. This was actually identified yesterday by the renal physician who was having a bit spack about difficult patients. And she said, oh, I feel so much better after Thursday lunchtimes because I can say whatever I need to say here about these extraordinarily difficult, often very codependent patients, and you don't all think I'm a nut. And we all went, hmm, sometimes we do. <laughs> <laughs> we feel like you're just Probably downloading on us. Here. We yeah. chose renal. Um, so I think, I think when you think about putting together those MDTs in the metastatic setting, they actually have a, a sustaining uh, and um, perhaps supervisory effect. Jane and Sandra? I just wanted to say that Cancer Australia um, launched a resource to, in 2014 called Clinical Guidance in Responding to Suffering in Patients with Cancer. It doesn't have the status of clinical practice guidelines, but it draws on the available evidence. And so this really is about the people who have not disorder, but who are suffering, who are distra distressed, who are facing spiritual or existential concerns. The thing about this document is it uses the words. 
there were clinical examples of how you could approach this, how you could discuss it in plain English. And I commend that to every single person who works clinically in cancer. Just another point on that. I would say it's, it's great for people to be skilled to deal with that, but we have a lot of potential power over the prevention of that morbidity. And this is where it comes back to what Sancho was talking about, having guidelines, having metrics, having very clear um, and mandated clinical referral pathways um, to ensure that people don't get into these situations where they are not fully informed and they're more prone then to having um, decisional re regret and morbidity. So we've got a couple of minutes left. We've got a couple of interesting questions um, about you know, patients from diverse backgrounds. English is not the first language, have a different cultural approach towards psychological distress. Sandra, you work probably in the most multicultural centre of the people sitting here. How do we approach that? I mean, Cathy works there too. I don't know whether you want to make a comment, Cathy, on this. No? It's running for cover. Um, so glad to see your consultation liaison service is working well. No, no, so, um, but seriously, you, you, it's not a one-size-fits-all here. No, it's, it's a really difficult problem. I'll probably learn, I'm learning lots today, but I'll probably learn from this panel or all these fantastic resources out there for the multicultural situation. I know there are through the Cancer Council, um, but, but it is a major problem and it's just another barrier um, to even understanding what people's issues are. Um, we obviously use a lot of interpreters, but, but that you, then you've got the additional restraint that it's all you can do in the 15 minutes you've got the interpreter to get across the, the you know, nuts and bolts about what treatment you're going to give this patient, let alone delve into anything around their personal or social or uh, psychological lives. I mean, maybe Sancha can comment and then I can know what to do. Uh, no, well, I was going to, another bit of advertising in that Bettina Mize is just completing a study that will be testing some, resor that's testing some resources uh, around um, communication skills um, with people from diverse backgrounds. I really wanted to make um, the equity point, and that is, as clinicians, we often um, believe we're doing a good job because of the work we do with the patients we can see. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why metrics become critical is that you um, get exposed to the people who you don't see. And the people who you don't see are often those who are most vulnerable, whether that's of low socioeconomic status, poor health literacy, um, other issues around navigating the system. And I just wanted to give an example where when I first um, was involved with Peter Mac, we did an evaluation of the breast nurses through the database. And they were telling us that they saw every patient with breast cancer who came to Peter Mac. And there were 250 patients in the database per year. There were 1,250 patients treated at Peter Mac with breast cancer every year. And they, what was happening was they were only seeing people coming through the surgical pathway, not the patients coming through a radiotherapy pathway or a chemotherapy pathway. And it's not until you actually make what I call population perspectives available to clinicians in how they understand the data about their practice that you expose the most vulnerable. And really, our system should be designed for those people and because they're not about the people who know how to find us. Interesting comment online. Um, person saying that uh, this, I come, I've come to most of the Cancer Institute Innovation Conferences. This is the one that's most dominated by women. Is it only women who care about this issue? Yeah. <laughs> Good point. I would say that men care about this issue in a different way. And, uh, so they're quiet they, about it. And yeah, they're probably a bit quieter about it. Um, but I was actually struck uh, by that, uh, looking around the audience, and I suspect that's because there are a lot of nurses here, so um, that might be uh, one of the reasons. But certainly I think uh, breast cancer has actually dominated a lot of the research uh, in this area, where a lot of clinicians are female. That's both good and bad. I think it's paved the way for a lot of our understanding, but I think it does tend to mean that some of what works for women uh, may not work for men, and we may need to sneak up on them uh, in a different way with the provision of psychosocial care. Um, so anyone who's got any good sneaky ideas about men, um, they would be welcome. One of the things I've learned from, from reading um, that lovely book by Steve Bidolf, um, Raising Boys, is that if you want to have an emotional uh, conversation with a male, the last thing you should do is make eye contact. That's a, that is complete disaster. So just assume that Sanch is my husband for a minute, and we're going to so talk about you know, our daughter's eating disorder. And so we should do this in bed. 
uh, or we should do this during the washing up or driving the car mm. and not actually sitting over the breakfast table looking at so each other. So does this mean you should be sleeping with your renal physicians? Or oh, right? yeah. I know she's a woman too. Um, uh, so if you were going to have a conversation about an emotional issue with a woman and you didn't make eye contact, she'd think you were a nut and didn't care. But for a man, it's actually much better to have that conversation sideways. And so when you're in your consulting room, a really good trick is to examine people. Get them up on the bench, touch them in a good way, uh, and then when you sit them up, you're actually leaning beside them like this on the examination couch. And the problem of cancer is out there and the emotions are out there and you can look at them in a different way from when you're identified, I'm saying you've got a problem, that's not gonna work very well. So the choreography of your consultation and the way you actually move people around in the room can make a rather, big difference. Rather than where your hands are in the examination well, I, I, process. Look, this, this is a different thing from let me hold your hand. I mean, that's not going to work for most guys, do you think? The knee? Ooh. But this, this could actually a bit work. Creepy. A bit creepy. Depends whether you met them on Tinder or not. Yeah, <laughs> I suppose. Depends whether they sing I'm in my choir. I'm kind of choir. sorry I brought this one up now. <laughs> so, so I think yeah, sneaky with men would be good and some more research with men I think is going to be very important as we move forward. They're probably a little bit like the socially anxious. They're less likely to come to your focus group. So Sandra, you both give us your insight into men. No, I've just, just got a, I, my sneaky idea, Fran, was to have um, the, the clinic next door, which now there's no room there, but to make the clinic the next door the sort of little mini gym for the, my, the prostate guys, have a bar at the back and just have some tables hanging the around so it could the be the support group at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the shed. shed. Um, I'll just quickly run through some of the comments that have been made online. There's been you know, support for the notion that after treatment, when you're in survivorship, your care needs to continue. There's strong support for that. An interesting point, which we won't talk about now, but it is an interesting point, is that not only do people spend a lot of money, they use up all their sick leave and all their annual leave, and the system doesn't cope with that. That's a really important point which is an advocacy point. Um, the, um, and another uh, one, which we just don't have time to get to, is just really how this plays out in the children, child and adolescent setting, a really important issue, which is also about being the child of somebody with cancer as well as being there. So these are all important points, and I thank everybody who made comments online and continue to do so uh, in the afternoon session as well. Could you please thank our panel?